I've struggled feeling like a fraud for so many years now. That imposter feeling started to show up again more and more after I released my new podcast this May. I don't know, I just didn't feel like a podcaster, you know? Even though I was seeing a lot of success thanks to you guys, I just always feel like the success that I have is just luck and not attributed to anything that I personally do. If you know that terrible feeling, you know that it is debilitating. So I sat down with some paper and what I started writing after some intense critical thinking unfolded into this epiphany on why I have imposter syndrome all the time and what I can do to overcome it. And I had never heard anybody have this take on imposter syndrome that I had like, that I had come up with. Those writings that day eventually turned into the season two premiere of the If Then podcast, which you're about to hear now. But be sure to stay till the end of the episode to learn how you can be the lucky winner of the specially engraved If Then podcast AirPods Max that I'm gonna give away at the end of season two. Who could be texting me? Congrats on the podcast launch. Thank you, Morgan. Let's check out episode one of the If Then podcast season two. My name is Jordan Taylor, and welcome to the If Then Podcast. Our brains are a conglomerate of if-then statements, like in computer code, and oftentimes, new lines of code are hard to write in our mind when we're trying new things. For example, if I want to play piano, then I need to read music. Sitting down and coding that particular if-then statement could take years of dedication, but when we do sit down and create new then statements for a complicated if, it feels freaking amazing. This podcast is your weekly motivation and mine to get uncomfortable and write some neurological code. The exaggerated esteem in which my life work is held makes me very ill at ease. I feel compelled to think of myself as an involuntary swindler. Albert Einstein. Before I announced season one of my podcast to everyone this May, I sat in a dark room, alone. The fan was on, too high actually, but I was in the middle of something, and I didn't even notice my bare feet chilling on the hardwood floor from wind blasts as I sat on the couch. My brain was occupied with one of the most unique things a human can do, something we've all done, something that seems a little self-important and stupid, but it's actually maybe the most important thing. I had my phone, and I was typing, deleting, typing, deleting. I hadn't used this app I was on in years, and that was exactly why I was on it that night for this task. It was the perfect place for what I was doing. I was on Twitter, but I wasn't tweeting. I was busy in an inconspicuous place, defining myself. A place that was public, yet very hidden. A safe place my bio. YouTuber, hobbyist, podcaster. Uh, YouTuber, podcast host, hobbyist. I was trying to make myself believe something I didn't feel like, even though I was really proud of the first two episodes that I had created but hadn't posted yet. I knew I had a legitimate podcast, but that didn't matter. See, I might have a podcast and therefore, by definition, be a podcaster, but every single other podcaster felt more authentic than me. I had the same suit and tie as them, we're all at the same party, but it's just a costume on me, while it's real on everyone else. I was an imposter, so I deleted the bio, turned off the fan, and slunk to bed. According to the article, commentary, prevalence, predictors, and treatment of imposter syndrome, a systematic review, Quote, Imposter syndrome is a condition that describes high-achieving individuals who, despite their objective successes, fail to internalize their accomplishments and have persistent self-doubt and fear of being exposed as a fraud or imposter. Individuals struggling with imposter syndrome do not attribute their performance to their actual competence, instead ascribe their successes to external factors such as luck or help from others while considering setbacks as evidence of their professional inadequacy." Unquote. 
I thought this feeling might go away as I released the first season of the If Then podcast, acting super confident in each episode, even giving prizes away to those who shared, but it never went away. In fact, I'm still feeling it, even right now, as I speak to you. I almost didn't continue season two of this podcast for this reason, even though the podcast release went better than I could have imagined, reaching number 25 for education and getting hundreds and hundreds of shares online, all thanks to you. But as the success rolled in, I just felt lucky, like I had nothing to do with it. I was an inadequate, untalented onlooker to success that I could only attribute to luck. I was just there as the shares rolled in, as I moved up the charts, trying to convince you that I was something I wasn't. After all, I'm just a dude in a room typing scripts on a computer. This feeling was debilitating, and I needed answers to make it stop. The other day, I was pulling weeds in my unkempt garden, avoiding writing for the podcast as this imposter feeling was growing, choking out the creativity from my brain. I was listening to a book a friend had recommended called The Courage to be Disliked, and in the midst of weeds as tall as me, a stalk yanked, a sapling shoveled, the author, Ikiro Kishimi, began talking about something that had me completely zoned in. In his book, which I highly recommend, about Adlerian psychology, he began talking about where uncontrollable human emotions really derive themselves. Like, for instance, when something happens and you find yourself reacting with seemingly no control. To exemplify his point of view, he uses the scene of a waiter spilling a drink all over a customer who then gets so uncontrollably angry that the customer shouts at the waiter without meaning to, in front of everyone. To explain the origin of this uncontrollable anger, Kashimi writes, quote, The goal of shouting came before anything else. That is to say, by shouting, you wanted to make the waiter submit to you and listen to what you had to say. As a means to do that, you fabricated the emotion of anger, unquote. Fabricating the emotion of anger? Could this really be true? To Kishimi, this anger, this emotion, was really felt and experienced. Yes, it was real, but it existed for a purpose, with an end in mind. Without that purpose, it wouldn't have existed, he argues. This idea of fabricating emotions that I really experience in order to manipulate a situation was profoundly interesting to me. I pulled another weed and thought, what if, in some backwards way, I was conjuring up the emotion of imposter syndrome? What if I was using it as a tool for some end? I wanted to explore this potential paradigm shift further. Was there a buggy line of code that I was unknowingly writing in my brain? An if-then statement that I needed to erase? To discover if this if-then statement was embedded in my neurological code, I tried writing it out on paper. I asked myself the ridiculous question, if I wanted imposter syndrome, then what would I gain? To my surprise, as I stood amongst a cleared garden bed, the book still playing in my ears, yet somehow silent now, the answer was apparent. By feeling like my success was luck, by not taking responsibility for those successes, I'm also slyly denying the responsibility for potential failure. I'm denying responsibility for my life. If my success is luck, then failure is bad luck. None of it's my fault. I can't be blamed. I'm just here as external factors bump me this way and that. Sure, the amount of competence I have might play some factor, I'm sure, but just how much, really? See, by internalizing this luck-centered framework, I have little, if any, responsibility for my life at all. On the one hand, this framework does bring comfort in some twisted sense, but at a big cost anxiety. And the more success I have, the more anxiety and fear I have that it might be taken away by some discovery from others that I really have no talent and that it was all just luck. That 
I'm an imposter. To eliminate this buggy imposter if then statement in my brain, I came up with a three line loop to replace it. In computer programming, a loop is code that runs again and again until a required outcome is finally met. Line one, take responsibility. This step seems hard and it is, don't get me wrong, but in a way, it's actually easy because you already have it. Responsibility is like your shadow. It's always there. Learning to not be scared of it or hide from it is what's hard because hiding from your shadow is just so easy, but it does come with a cost. You have to live in the dark and the darker the engulfment, the more your shadow disappears, which short term is great because that was the goal, but now you have the weight of darkness over you instead of that warm, guiding light. The more you want your shadow undefined, the more weighty the darkness around you has to be, the more you can't see where you're going, the more lost you become as you awkwardly stumble, still trying to reach that destination you're dreaming of, but held back by the fear of your own small, casted shadow, so you engulf yourself in even greater darkness and, opportunely, greater excuses for why you can't see where you're going why you haven't made it to your destination. I mean, is it even your fault you can't see at this point? It's the stupid cave's fault. You can't hide from responsibility and live a meaningful life. So make your shadow as defined as possible on the ground beneath you as you adventure openly in the warm light to your sought after destination. Line two, accept the outcome, whether success or failure. The outcome isn't what matters, because the result doesn't define you. What defines you is that you actually got up, made a decision, moved in a direction. Sure, it was your first decision, maybe it wasn't the best one, but at least you made one and learned. By accepting that you have the power to decide your outcome is terrifying. It's not luck, it's not chance, it's not other people, it's you. I cannot think of something more terrifying and empowering than that. Accept that you can royally screw up and that you can wonderfully succeed and either way, it's on you. And that's a good thing. Line three, treat success or failure the exact same way as a learning experience. Your reaction to success should be the same as failure. In the words of Rudyard Kipling, quote, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, yours is the world and everything that's in it. Unquote. You're never changing, you're constant. If you're praised for your work, you accept the praise and continue learning. If you're corrected for your work, you accept the correction and continue learning. Either way, you're moving forward, constantly. The only way you move backwards is when you revel in praise or when you stoop in failure. By taking every scenario as the same learning experience, success and failure will start to meld into one continual forward motion for good. After line three is complete, start again at line one. Accept responsibility, then get feedback from your decision's outcome, then learn from the feedback, then start again at line one and repeat. This is how you debug imposter syndrome from your brain and realize that your life and where and who you are is not luck and you don't want it to be. It's responsibility accepted, it's outcomes experienced, it's adjustments made, it's you. And yes, that's scary, but would you really have it any other way? So I'll leave you with this. The exaggerated esteem in which my life work is held makes me very ill at ease. I feel compelled to think of myself as an involuntary swindler. Albert Einstein. Thank you so much for listening to the season two premiere of the If Then podcast. If you have feedback you want to give me, I would love to hear from you over on my Instagram at If Then Podcast or by emailing me at contact at if then podcast.com. And if you would, leave me a five star review if you found this podcast valuable. It really helps the podcast to get seen by other people like yourself. We're almost at 500 reviews on Spotify and 250 on Apple Podcasts. And on a personal note, I love reading what you have to say in your reviews. Like Apologetics Guy who said, I feel like this podcast has been removing my obstacles to success one by one. 
This is incredible. If you remember, last season we surpassed 100 shares on Instagram, and for that, I randomly selected one of you who shared and gave away AirPods. Tyler was the lucky winner and was super excited, but this season, I wanted the prize to be even bigger and more exciting. I really wanted to go all out as a huge thank you to everyone who's been sharing. So this season, I'm giving away AirPods Max with a special If Then podcast engraving. These things are sweet, and I'm really jealous of whoever gets them. All you have to do to enter to win is take a screenshot of this podcast and share it on your Instagram while tagging the account at If Then Podcast in the post or story. If you've shared before, you can always share again to be entered to win this season. If we get to 200 shares by the end of season two, you'll have a chance to win the AirPods Max. And don't forget, as an extra bonus, as you share and spread the word each week on Instagram as we're building to that 200 mark, I always give away two free one-month Audible gift cards every week I release an episode, which includes a free credit for an audiobook of your choice, plus access to their Plus catalog, which includes thousands of audiobooks with no credits needed. Again, screenshot this episode, tag at If Then Podcast in your poster story, and you'll be entered to win both an Audible gift card this week and AirPods Max at the end of season two. And be sure to follow at If Then Podcast on Instagram to find out if you're the winner this week. Thank you so much for listening. My name is Jordan Taylor, and what if then will you write today?